welcoming Jamie Dom from JD Integrative Marketing. And she spoke about uh, di digital marketing. Our leaders can use data to expand their reach. And thirdly, we had uh, Dr. Kido and Udo Oyoyo from uh, Loma Linda. And they had a conversation about educational research and leadership, drawing leadership principles from cognitive um, genesis. Mm -hmm. And last week, we had Dr. Ella Simmons and Lisa Birdsley. And uh, they spoke about how educational leaders approach decision-making dilemmas. And today, the last day, we have a very special guest who will be introduced very shortly by our president, Dr. Andrea Luxton. But he will speak about the data temptation, how to use organizational data for strategic leadership. So we really, really uh, enjoy this series. And we know that we beyond those who are now on on Zoom, we have others following on Facebook. And even after that, it will be posted on our YouTube page. And, and even more and more people watch those presentations and benefit from the discussion that we have. We thank our team, uh, the leadership team, and some of them are here, or most of them are present this evening. And some of them, you are going to hear their voices. Some of them, uh, perhaps not. Uh, but I can see uh, uh, Dr. Dwayne, Kovic, uh, who enjoys speaking about ethics. Uh, we have Dr. Janet Ledesma, who is in charge of our educational leadership program, preparing principals and superintendents for our schools and for the public system as well. We also have those two people who are going to have the conversation with uh, Dr. Trim today, uh, Dr. Randy Siebold and Dr. Eric Baumgartner. And they are also uh, part of the global leadership team, helping to prepare leaders around the world for the church. And we have those who are helping us. Uh, we have uh, Evelyn, our administrative assistant. She's always there and she's helping the, us on the technical side. Uh, and also Amanda, I don't know if we can see them and they can say hello. <laughs> All right, thank you. Thank you for your dedicated service. Mm -hmm. And we also have a number of participants also. Uh, we won't be able to call all the names this evening, um, but we would like to tell all of you that we appreciate your presence. Without you, it would not be possible for us to have this uh, series. And we uh, thank God for your participation, for the questions, your questions and your comments. And at this time, I'm going to um, invite our president, Dr. Andrea Luxton, the president of the Andrews University, to please share the greetings from the administration, offer the opening prayer, and then introduce our special guest for today. Dr. Luxton, welcome. Thank you very much. And again, uh, it's a pleasure for me to be here and I'd like to uh, welcome everybody here. I know that this is the end of a series that has uh, been enlightening and helpful to everybody. So. Uh, thank you all for being present and for all of the the team, the leadership team that have, have put on this, this excellent uh, series of, of lectures and webinars. Um, uh, let, let's just start with a word of prayer and then I, I'll turn to our speaker for the day. Let's pray together. Our Lord and our God, we thank you so much that uh, you have called us all to be leaders in different ways and in different places. And uh, I pray for everyone in this group and as we go into this webinar today, I, I pray that he will be with the speaker and may the things he shares be helpful, be practical to us uh, as we serve you and the church uh, and seek to do so even more effectively. We pray all these things in Jesus name. Amen. Amen. Well, it was, it was my special privilege to be invited to introduce our speaker today. I have known Dr. Trim. Uh, David for, for many years and going back to days in England. Um, uh, Dr. Trim is now the Director of Archives, Statistics and Research for the General Conference. Uh, his life started in um, Bombay in, in India. And then he went back to his home country of his parents in Sydney, Australia, uh, but um, did his college career in England at Newport College 
he has a, a BA cum laude from Newport College. Uh, and then he continued in England and completed a PhD from King's College London. Um, uh, so I knew him as a student at Newport College, but I also knew him uh, when he was hired as a faculty member. Uh, in fact, he, he says that I hired him. I hired him to his first job at Newport College, where he taught history, humanities, religion, and some postgraduate classes too. Um, most particularly, um, both as a student and then as a faculty member, uh, David was known for his uh, thoughtfulness, his inquiring mind, um, and his capacity to, to bring many disparate ideas together in a very cohesive and communicative way. Um, it's not surprising that he was then invited to be the Walter C. Art Chair in History at PUC for two years. Um, and then in 2010, he was elected to his current position serving the world church. Uh, I, I did find a few interesting things in his biography I did not know. I was not aware that Dr. Trim is the only Seventh-day Adventist scholar that was, has been elected a fellow of the Royal Historical Society. And he has also held a number of visiting fellowships uh, in the Netherlands, in the UK, and in the University of Berkeley, of California, in Berkeley. Uh, since 2014, in addition to his current role in the GC, he has also been a professor of church history and mission at the Seventh-day Adventist Theological Seminary at Andrews. Um, as you might imagine, he's authored or co-authored a number of books um, and edited with 13 books in total, including A History of the Trans-European Division, um, A Passion for Mission, and A Living Sacrifice, Unsung Heroes of Adventist Mission, recently published 2019 by Pacific Press. You will see that he has consistently integrated his love of, of history with his love of mission and the church. And uh, in, in that way, he has contributed significantly uh, to the church. Um, he is married to Wendy, who I also taught as a student at Newball College. And they have a daughter, Eve, and she lives in Europe. She lives in Berlin. So uh, Dr. Trim, welcome to our webinar today. We're delighted that you could uh, join us and uh, I will pass over to you. Thank you very much. Well, thank you. I just wanna say, I'm Dr. Luxton, thank you for the introduction. Uh, I thought it was gonna be especially helpful since you guys have had a connection and I appreciate that. Um, and uh, Dr. Trim, very excited about uh, tonight's conversation and just to give uh, our, our uh, colleagues uh, who are joining us here, a bit of a context. We're going to spend roughly maybe a half hour, maybe 35, 40 minutes in conversation, uh, Dr. Eric Baumgartner, uh, Dr. Trim and myself. And then we want to turn it over to uh, Dr. Jay Brand uh, to navigate the chat conversation and maybe some of the questions inside of the chat. So as you're thinking and listening, uh, please uh, don't wait till the end to put the questions in. Uh, I know Dr. Brand is very good at this. He loves his work and reading and responding. And so there can sometimes be a bit of a conversation uh, going on parallel in the chat. Uh, David, if you're able to keep all of that, that's fine too. Uh, I usually don't, I just uh, trust Dr. Brand to take care of that. So uh, as we start, uh, let me just uh, invite you to um, uh, just give us a, a bit of an overview about the work you do. You work at the General Conference of the Seventh-day Adventists, the World Church Headquarters, if you will. And, uh, and so give us a, maybe just a little bit of an idea about what you do there. Certainly, Randy, I'd be delighted to. And But first, let me say thank you to Andrea for that very kind welcome. Uh, I've, it's 32 years, just over 32 years, in fact, since I uh, first met her when I went as a student to Newbold. Uh, and you were talking about leadership. She gave me my first job. So obviously, she's a far-sighted and visionary leader. Um, <laughs> in all seriousness, of course, the people we hire often are the, you know, a very good estimate of, the, of, of our leadership. But I really appreciate her words coming as they do from someone with whom I have such a, 
uh, a long, and indeed my family has a, has a long connection. Um, as director of the Office of Archives, Statistics and Research, in one way, what we do is quite simple. Um, we manage the General Conference archives, we collect statistics and we undertake research. You know, what could be simpler <laughs> from the title? Um, mm. In practice, it's rather more complicated than that uh, because managing the archives, you know, the office is at the GC, but it has a global responsibility. Now, our archives, what kind of things do you archive? So we manage the general conference archives, but we also provide training and consultancy and conduct accreditations for church archives and record centers around the world. And with these statistics, we actually collect and publish two sets of data. I didn't say statistics, but of data. One is the Seventh-day Adventist yearbook, um, which is the indispensable guide to the church. Uh, that includes some statistics, but is generally other kinds of data. But if you want to understand the church, and if you, in fact, if anyone really wants to get a, a picture of how complex and international the church is, they need to leaf through the yearbook. Because even people who work for the church, even at high levels, will often look at the, I've had them say, they've looked at the yearbook and said, wow, I didn't know that. Um, so that's a very major task. Then we also collect the church's official statistics, uh, mandated, I may say, by the third general conference session in 1865. So collecting statistics is incredibly Adventist. Mm -hmm. uh, it's been done almost literally since the church was founded. And actually, I can say that at the very first founding GC session in 1863, there was a statistical report, but it was only from the Michigan conference, which was the most organized conference, but they had a statistical report. And then in two years later, they said, let's make this every year. Um, and those statistics are membership, they're congregational, but they also relate to personnel, and they relate to missions. So they're very complex uh, set of statistics there as well. The yearbook and the annual statistical report we publish on an annual cycle, but that also involves all the collection of the data, which is by no means straightforward. And then I say we undertake research. That's really added. The office used to be the Office of Archives and Statistics. In 2011, uh, research was added. And we both undertake historical research based very often on the collections, collections in our archives and on the statistics. Because in doing church historical research for the officers, they're particularly interested in trends. So the statistics very much play into the historical research. But then we also conduct very major international social science research projects. And really, we could talk on another occasion about those. But I know you want to talk about mm. the statistics, but that just that just gives a sense of the complexity of what we do. Yeah, it's enormous uh, what you guys are doing. And um, I remember when the name of the office was Office of Archives and Statistics. Did research, was that added when you came in? It was. It was added in 2011 after I came on board. Okay. So um, that makes you a very good participant of our, of, of our group here because we are especially interested in research. And I remember one of the things that just stood out in my mind as as very unusual when you came into the office was that suddenly there was talk about um, accountability for data um, not only to collect the right kind of data and to do that faithfully as required uh, as you mentioned by the journal conference but also to to look at the data from a qualitative viewpoint. Is it accurate what we are actually reporting uh, year by year? Um, how did you go about uh, convincing the church that that was necessary? <laughs> well, when it came to membership statistics, my task was made easier by the fact that uh, the, the newly elected GC secretary elected in 2010, Dr. G.T. Ung, who's just retired, um, is personally extremely passionate about accurate membership statistics and about replacing baptism with discipleship, which is biblical. And those of you who studied your New Testament will know that actually what the Great Commission is, is a call to discipleship with baptizing a part, an important part, but only a part of that. Uh, so this was a particular passion of his. 
Um, but also, I think, if I may say so, my predecessors felt that their job was simply to collect the statistics and then give a very basic summary of what they were. It seems to me that what if the church is going to pay to have an office of archives and statistics and research and to have a director, that what they really want is analysis of trends. Because if the director of statistics of the World Church isn't going to point out what the trends are, who is going to do that? Um, and so you can't point out the trends unless one is honest with the data and what they're really saying. So I felt that it was an integral part of my job to be saying, right, these are data that we can trust. These are data that we can't verify. Uh, and, or, and trying to move the church towards a greater transparency and accountability, which, you know, let's be honest, we're, we're talking about integrity, integrity with, with, with church statistics. Mm -hmm. um, but I had the support of the General Conference Secretary f f in doing that. Otherwise, we couldn't have made such steps as we have made towards that goal. Yeah, I remember that one of the consequences of that uh, push was that suddenly divisions, or at least certain divisions that were growing relatively rapidly suddenly at the end of the year reported a net loss and i said to myself that must really be very courageous for a division president to actually watch how the membership statistics in his uh, field are going down by the hundreds of thousands that i thought was was quite remarkable yeah um it's unfortunately we have come in the Adventist church, and I do believe it's something in the last 50 years to define ourselves by numbers. But if we look at the Bible, you know, very often God doesn't go with the larger numbers. Gideon is told the people you have with you are too many to do this work. Mm -hmm. God is looking for, 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 for quality. And I would say, it's, it's hard to be certain, but from my historical research into the church, I believe that it's a relatively recent development, uh, or at least only in the last third of our history for the first two thirds. If, if you look at general conference session reports by the secretary, by division presidents, or reports to annual council, there is not an emphasis on saying, look how many people we have baptized. Instead, there's a, a very honest statement, you know, we're only very few in this territory. In the whole of South America, we only have this few. In the whole of Southern Africa, this few. But our members are faithful. And if you look at the reports, that's what the focus is on. It's not about growth. It's yeah. about our members are faithful in the face of very great challenges. And then they pivot to the numbers. But the numbers are always the number of people yet, yet to reach. And so it becomes a springboard for mission. Whereas... I think what happened, and it didn't happen overnight, and it wasn't due to one person, it happened gradually, and if people had had a choice, they might have said, we won't do that, but it happened gradually, which was to almost a sense of boastfulness about numbers. And, you know, obviously one of the best known passages in the Bible about numbers is, is King David being judged for enumerating right. the people. And I have had church leaders say to me, you know, oh, what do you... Is what you're doing correct? Of course, there's also the book of numbers and Ezra numbers the people. And uh, we know there were 3000 people baptized on the day of Pentecost. So that numbers are quite biblical. But Ellen White says something very interesting about that uh, passage in Second Kings and uh, uh, rather Second Samuel and, uh, and First Chronicles, which is that it's David's pride that makes it a sin. It's not the enumeration. It's because David wants to be able to say, look how much stronger the kingdom is than when I became king. It's kind of the Nebuchadnezzar syndrome. Is this not great Babylon that I have built? Mm -hmm. and, and, and dare I say it, I think there have been a few church leaders around the world who, 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 have, who have wanted to be able to say, look how much stronger the church is now than when I took over. And I think that helps to explain um, the, the shift. But I think it's also because, of course, we want people to join the church. We want more people to be baptized and to become fervent disciples. And we, to some extent, mistook quantity for quality. But as I say, if you look at our history in the 
right up to 1970, perhaps even to 1980, there's an emphasis on, on quality of spiritual relationship and numbers are chiefly used as a springboard to say, this is still what we still have to do. Let's be busy about it. Hmm. Well, I, I appreciate that's a, that's a, it, it's, it's kind of a, a helpful perspective to get that historical perspective and see the shift and kind of shows how subtly things can shift while you're not even aware. Um, you know, it seems like with all of you know, these data that are collected, um, you know, this is, you know, we're part of the context of this webinar is in teaching a class. We've mentioned that research for decision makers and uh, bringing in some guests to think about uh, the idea of research, collecting data, and then using that for decision making. So inside of our res academic research institution, we use this for research. Often there's ideas and they become developed and, and they may or may not be used for decision making. So uh, uh, thinking about turning this towards the role that you have at the general conference, this of course, is not an academic institution. It's, it's an institution that says collecting these data can help us move our work forward. So um, can you give us maybe a bit of an insight into how you see the, 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 the work that comes through all of the work that you do, how does, how does that get turned in? So do, do, you know, can pastors use this? Can conference presidents use this union, division, GC? Maybe you can give us maybe a little illustration of some possible ways all of this can be, all of these data, the research can be used to leverage and strengthen decision-making. It's a great question, Randy. And um, I think the first thing is for, for, for church leaders to be aware that the data is there. Um, <laughs> it's interesting, the yearbook is extremely well known. And indeed, there's an interesting phenomenon in which people are, are very um, protective of their status in the yearbook of where they appear and various such things, which I view with a, a sort of, you know, by, by the way, can I just interrupt briefly? You know, you mentioned the yearbook earlier and you used a phrase that I haven't heard recently, leafing through the yearbook as if it was a physical document. And, and it always was. Now I'm assuming it's available online. It's, it's been available for some time. There's a website. You can, after a year after it's been published, you can download it as a PDF. But okay. from the even when it's the latest version is in print, you can access the data via a website and you can search. Okay. So it's so, not reading the PDF, but you're accessing all the data and you can search it. And there is an app. There is a yearbook app so you can access it for, for church leaders who are busy and traveling to be able to access it on their phone or their, their tablet. And, and this uh, like a web address? Yes, it's very, all our website URLs are very easy to remember, adventistyearbook.org. Oh, well, there you go. And for the, we have a statistics website where you, which I wish, I hope every one of your students on this call will use it at some point, and I wish more church members were aware mm -hmm. of it, adventiststatistics.org. It's very easy to remember, as I say. I like that, nicely done. Yeah. And yeah. You as can. My, uh, I you don't can, know, uh, David, if you are aware of the fact that when I was in the Mission Institute and I was starting to teach church growth uh, in the seminary, um, the way this whole AdventistStatistics.org came about was that we could not get accurate statistics out of the, the printed annual reports, uh, statistical reports. And I gave my students uh, um, a homework assignment and I told him over this semester you have to do a research paper based on 10 years of uh, statistical analysis of your field and in in those 12 weeks that we had together or 10 weeks what it was they could not get all the statistics they needed because sometimes their fields uh, said oh just use the the annual statistical report and didn't want to actually send them the sheet that they had prepared where they had all the categories. So they could not say, for instance, how many people were 
uh, baptized versus people who were disfellowshipped because only certain uh, columns, so to speak, were uh, published in the annual statistical report. So what we did is we asked the your office if you would be willing to let us enter the data. And that's what we did. And yep. the people who actually entered the data were Kleber Gonzalez, who is now at the GC. In <laughs> well, Andrews. He's at Andrews. He's at Andrews. To or be at precise. Andrews, yes. <laughs> and the other one was Peter Chincala. There's Peter Chincala, who is the director of um, research here at Andrews and also working with the mission department. They were the ones that actually put it in. But we could not turn it into an actual database. And it took a junior in college who happens to be Jonathan Brower. Yes, yes. Who, who helped you us know, do it. And we're all very did, we're yeah. all very much in your debt, Erich. We're all very much in your <laughs> debt for the, for the for the vision to do that. Yeah. Um, but at that website, you can ident you can look at statistics for any organizational unit of the church. Yes. Or any part of its history, you can either look at one year or you can download any range of years as Excel spreadsheets. So if you want to do trend analysis of the church, mm -hmm. you can do it adventistatistics.org. See, but the yearbook, as I say, is widely known. The annual statistical report is not. It's people like Erich and missiologists who have used it and people who work in Adventist mission at the GC and at the divisions who tend to use it. I would wish all church leaders would use it. Now, so, second, uh, so a pastor, how could, do you think a pastor would find something like this? Would, think, it, would, would it drill think, down that far? I think it could. It's not going to be as useful, but for anyone down to uh, conference, conference, union, division, or institution leadership, hmm. but they will find things that are, are useful. For a pastor, they'll find things that are interesting and give them a different context for the church. I see. They'll have a deeper understanding of the church. So I think it could work uh, for just for, even for any church member who's mm. who has the data addiction and would like to know would like to know more. Um, but I would wish that it were more that website that was created thanks to Erich and his students. I would wish that it was more widely known and more widely used. And also what we've done over the last 10 years is to make the annual statistical report more friendly. We've started adding charts and graphs, which actually were there up until around the 1950s and they disappeared. So strictly speaking, we restored them. But obviously that presents all these massive tables, presents the data in immediately graphic form that you can look at. Mm -hmm. And we also have added um, tables that are, speak more precisely to mission. For example, tables about the 1040 window. So yes. the data are yeah. there. Um, what we need is for church leaders to make more use of them. And maybe yeah. that could be a role for a class like this, uh, you know, research for decision makers um, by actually illustrating how a tool like that could be used for strategic decision making. I think that would be something. Um, could you give us an example, for instance, what kind of data um, is available on that? Um, what, so, uh, most obviously, membership data, which is the, the headline that most people look at, but also information on the number of churches and companies. And one of the things that I've highlighted in my last three or four annual council reports is how much membership growth is tied to church planting. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's, it's astonishing to me, but there are still many parts of the world where there's a degree of resistance to church planting, um, which I, I, I just find astonishing, but it's there. And, and so I've been trying to emphasize church planting is connected with church growth. So you can see there the number of churches, companies, congregation, uh, total congregations. Um, you've got the number of employees, um, the number of employees engaged in different types of work, pastoral and evangelistic work, educational work, health work, uh, and so forth. You've got tables of countries showing the number of Adventists plus uh, the population. And one of the things we've added in, in our quest for accountability, as I think Randy described it near the start, we include in those country tables, and we include in the charts we print every year, the mortality rate. Now, this sounds 
literally a morbid thing to publish the mortality rate why do we do that because it gives us a check on the accuracy of membership records what i discovered when i came to the office from my staff they had become aware of the fact that there are regions of the world where adventist reported mortality is 10 percent or less of general mortality now there should be an adventist health advantage but it's nothing like that. That's telling us that the membership figures are wrong. So again, this is where a pastor or a church member could find it useful. Um, I have this dream that actually people will look at it and pay attention to it. And I'm sure nobody has done that since we started printing it. But it's there if people want to know, are the membership figures that I'm hearing for my country, my conference, actually reliable? Or are they wishful thinking? Uh, the mortality rate allows them to do that kind of um, reflection for themselves. Mm -hmm. So those are, those are some of the kind of data points we have. You, you have mentioned the, the idea of auditing uh, more than once now. Um, when, you, when you went about uh, actually auditing the membership statistics of the different world fields, um, how do you do that? Because you have I presume the fields reporting to the unions and then the unions report to the division and the division sends it to you or, or some such mechanism. So these are actual data that are being sent to you and they, they are checked at the lowest level, if, if I understand correctly. So how would you make sure that these data that are being sent to you are actually, quote, audited? Did you have a special mechanism, how, how you could assure that? It's an excellent question. Um, and there is a distinction here between the church's finances, which are heavily audited and thus very trustworthy. And I wish that we had the same approach to our membership statistics. Um, the truth is, and most of your students, I would imagine, have worked for the church as a pastor in some kind of administrative or institutional position. So I think they will all be aware the the great weakness of our statistics is that they are all collected ultimately by volunteer church clerks mm -hmm. who require no training, who in fact, in many places, the chief qualification is that they're willing to do it and who mean very well and who want to do things right, but who ultimately that relies on them and also because we collected in paper, there were limits to the amount of data that we could collect. And so we've only collected fairly basic statistics. Now that we're moving to collecting through membership systems, we will have a much richer uh, and larger data set on members than we've ever had before. And that's, that's only can be only a good thing. Um, but it is ultimately collected voluntarily and then reported up voluntarily so we can't audit it how then can we do a check on the accuracy the mortality rate is our key indicator um and i know perfectly well what divisions and unions or countries of the world have reliable or unreliable or utterly unreliable membership statistics i know that perfectly well um because we've we've done the analysis um, it's not something we publicly state because it's better to encourage people than to chide them publicly to, if we want to see a change. And we want to see a change. We want accurate records that show integrity and truthfulness. So that's why I'm not going to tell you now where, where are the places that have utterly unreliable membership statistics. But, you know, the class can go and do their own research and they can work it out for themselves quite easily. Um, but that's the way we can check. And we also do have a process by which divisions report for all their unions and conferences and missions, which are in the process of auditing, how far along in that process they are. There are various mechanisms we have, but none of these figures are, strictly speaking, audited. They are what we, they are what we receive, which is why if any of you, your class, have ever listened to me give a report, you, you, I almost always speak of reported membership. I'm very careful to speak of reported membership. They are the figures that we receive. They are what we have. Um, and I believe that 
though they're exaggerated, there's probably consistency in exaggeration over the years so that one can actually reasonably work out a trend, if you see what I'm trying to say. Mm -hmm. um, but that this is what we have. They're not audited. There are certain things we can do to check the reliability. And then we try to work through the general conference executive officers, through the associate secretaries who liaise with divisions, with division secretaries, and if need be, their presidents, to try to get the divisions audited. And some have been reluctant. Some have been eager. I'll single out South America, which set a fantastic example and since 2006 have taken off well over 2 million members off their books. They now have them, but their membership is more than 2 million now, but they have confidence that those members are there. And they, for those who think, oh, will God bless, will we continue to grow if we audit the South American division? So yes, there have been other divisions that were reluctant to do it at first, but now have done it and have done it, you know, admirably, very, very well, uh, and, you know, I, I, I hope that I would like to see every territory and indeed every church pastor should audit his or her membership records, mm -hmm. because ultimately, this isn't about having accuracy to the ninth place or, or tenth, seeing we have over 20 million members. What it really is about is about discipleship and care for our members. And if we don't know how many members we have, how are we ever going to care for them? Hmm. Well, thank you. You know, uh, I've been watching the chat along with our conversation. We've planned a few more questions, but the chat has been extraordinarily busy. And so, Dr. Brand, uh, I know you've been watching what's happening. You've been, uh, you want to maybe craft a question or do you want to give us an idea about what's happening uh, inside the chat? Maybe uh, even a, address a question or two to uh, well, Dr. I'm, Trim. I, I will do my best. Um, I, you know, I'm, um, this is uh, risky, but yeah, let me, I'll try to, find some there's min, many um but um what there's some questions about um you know what are what do you see uh, i like high level questions so i apologize if i'm uh, misprioritizing in some of your views but um what do you see as some of the most important trends uh you know that um, come out that have come out of these data and um and this is a this is more of a specific way to phrase that um, what do you see from these data as the primary existential threat to the church? Mm. Wow, an existential threat. Um, and I'm not sure that I'm necessarily qualified to speak to that. Um, ask me the first question again. Well, I, I'm still flummoxed by the existential threat. Ask me the first <laughs> part of the question again, Jay. You're uh, muted. Yeah. The most important trends. Right. From the right. Okay. So one of the most important trends, in a sense, is the trend we don't know. Because our membership figures are inaccurate, we don't know what our growth rate is. This is the question I constantly get asked. And even when I emphasize membership loss, people say, well, what's our attrition rate? We don't know because we don't know what our membership is. You know, unless we work that out, everything else is, is, is flawed and is tainted. Um, I am working with some very gifted Adventist statisticians to do uh, analysis that would enable us to try and get at least an approximation of what our real membership was at every point since around 1970, so that we can then do an actual kind of growth analysis. But, you know, I spoke at the 19, oh, sorry, 2015 GC session and highlighted membership loss. And I knew there would be people who would say, oh, would would be only too glad to say, ah, oh, you see, under Elder Wilson, the member, you know, our growth has declined and, 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 and so forth. So I made the point, but people still said it, but I made, I stressed the point, it looks like we're having a church growth crisis, and we're not, because the people who are being taken off through audits, in many cases, in their own minds, left the church five years, 10 years, 20 years ago. They've simply been registered as missing in the last 10 years. But in their own minds, they haven't been Adventists, literally in some cases for decades. Um, so we, we, 
I wish I could tell, talk more about that trend and I can't, and it's a deep frustration to me as perhaps you can tell because I, I love numbers and I love trends, but if we don't know what our accurate membership is, then everything else, as I say, is tainted. However, there is a trend which I think we're seeing, and again, because we're comparing the reported membership with reported membership, I, I, I touched on this at annual council last year. I think we are seeing a plateauing of, of growth. And that would be, one would say that that impression was sustained by the 2020 membership figures, but of course they've been affected by COVID. So they have to be regarded as sui generis and, and, and who knows what the long-term impact will be. But what I felt I could see there was that, yes, we were still growing. We were still having lots and lots of accessions but if the membership is is growing, then the X number of accessions and the, should also be growing in step with that. And in fact, accessions were plateauing. That's what I, I felt I could see from in from recent trends. And I linked that to plateauing in church growth. Uh, sorry, in um in church planting. Church planting had plateaued, and to me that is so. I and and I think that probably is. Um, one of the church's greatest threats that if we don't if we just assume that what we've always done will and that's worked will continue to work because hey we're having a million plus baptisms every year not last year but that was covid uh if we keep assuming that that's the probably the best way to ensure that it doesn't happen and church planting in particular we can't be complacent about um mm. because that is the engine you can see it very clearly that is the engine that has driven membership growth. So to me, that's one of the deep threats. I do think, though, the other is this focus on numbers, defining ourselves by numbers um, rather than by holistic discipleship. And I, I, my, my, my quest to achieve greater accuracy in records, as I say, it isn't just for the the beauty of the statistics and having exactly accurate statistics. The nature of the beast is we'll never have exactly accurate statistics, though we can get a lot closer. But my concern is that we um, have a stronger emphasis on discipleship because we lose, and we know from our own statistics, which are we know are inaccurate. We know that we've lost 15 million members in the last 50 years. We know that our attrition rate is four out of 10. So, you know, I'm looking, we have 40 participants on the call. So, you know, you can do the maths. Four out of 10, 16 of you statistically will leave the church. Now, this group may mean that you're disproportionately likely to stay, but I, you know, in any group, you can do the maths. And I invite you at church next time you're at church, look around and count off two out of every five people and think they're going to leave. That's an existential threat. <laughs> It's interesting what you're saying, and I'm not sure that everybody uh, really captures what you said, for instance, when you said that the growth rate has stopped. So let me make it uh, uh, very accessible to everybody. If you have 100 members and you baptize 10 members, 10 new members, your growth rate uh, in this simple example is 10%. Okay, if you, if you grow to be a church of 200 and you are still baptizing 10 members, you have the same number of accessions, but your growth rate is no longer 10%, it's now only 5%. So um, the growth rate, in order to keep up with the actual growth of the church, uh, should have should also be, be be larger and and what we are beginning to see is that while we do have approximately an, a million uh new accessions that is no longer um, as big of a growth rate as it once was we used to grow at least in some places seven percent a year now when you grow seven percent a year the church is doubling in membership every 10 years. When, and by the way, 
that's one of those secrets that statisticians uh, uh, easily know. What you do is you basically take that ex, uh, that percentage um, and you take the number 72 and 72 divided by the growth rate, 7% gives you 10, so that's 10 years. If it's 3.5, then it's 20 years. If it's one point something, then it can be much, much larger, which basically means the church is no longer really growing and, and, and experiencing that dynamic uh, forward movement. Yeah. Uh, go ahead, Jay. Yeah, please, Jay, thank yeah, you. It, Dr. Trim, just to follow up there, there's been a lot of questions uh, related to what you mentioned, which is, uh, you know, I mean, a lot of us maybe have the impression, probably naively so, but, you know, that the church often emphasizes, you know, baptisms over retention. And you mentioned the issue of discipleship. Uh, would there be any important insights uh, that we could glean from the data, the rich data that you, um, that you oversee that would tell us, for example, the most important factors in retention and what are the best approaches to discipleship and so forth. I mean, just some insights along those lines. Many, many questions regarding, uh, you know, discipleship. What, what it does is it defines for us the dimensions of the problem. And I think all of your students, I'm sure, will be familiar with the, 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 the statement that the first task of a leader is to define reality. Not that they create it, but to understand what the reality is. And this is our reality. Um, and in some parts of the world, it's worse than others. In some parts of the world, it looks better than it is because people aren't actually taking off people who've left the church. Um, and therefore, even, member, and therefore, membership looks stable, but it's not. Is or it, it's, it's exaggerated. It's exaggerated. Oh, okay. Sure, sure. And actually, you know, I, I know when I've talked about this in some parts of the world, there's an assumption that this is a problem in certain parts of the world and not others. There is no division that does not have exaggerated membership. Let's just be clear. Um, my friends from North America, there is no division that does not have exaggerated membership and could not profitably engage in membership audits. Um, I think what you, can, what you can do, even from the statistics we have though, is see that there's a significant problem. Um, and I, my sense, by the way, is that there is a, the, the attitudes are changing. I've been asked to speak in various parts of the world and indeed in the last several months via Zoom to other parts of the world about this very issue. And some parts of the world where for 30 years, the emphasis was just on baptize, baptize, baptize. Now they're saying, well, just a minute, we've had all these baptisms. Where are the members? We have a problem here. We have to change. So I think there's a, I think there's a, a recognition that there's an issue and there's a desire to change and to do, to do better. Um, so it, it firstly can give us the, give us a sense of the dimension of the problem, but also, you know, one of the things we've introduced since I came to office and it, met with some resistance, but it's increasingly being taken up, is membership attendance counts for Sabbath school and church, um, which means, again, it, as well as the mortality rate, you can do a cross-check. This is the supposed membership. This is the attendance. If nothing else, what it tells a church leader is, um, maybe the membership figures are reliable, but the attendance is telling me that there's a problem in this local church or in this conference. Mm. And as a leader, you want to know about that and ought to know something about it. So I, ultimately, you need to do qualitative, probably, um, but also quantitative social science methodological research to find out what the issues are. And we have sponsored some of that. And I could talk about that on another occasion. What the statistics give you, though, is a sense of what the problem is and where there is a particular problem. Uh, David, just a quick question. Uh, how about uh, higher education? Is there a is there this same detailing that happens inside of higher education? Is there anything that we could learn in in that part of uh, the church system? Sure. I mean, <laughs> uh, we we collect statistics on on institutions and publish them. Mm -hmm. 
Hospitals are no longer terribly good at reporting, at least in certain parts of the world. So if you look in the annual statistical report, you'll see whole divisions have just got lines showing that there's no report. But others do have them. And for education, our reports, are, there's a lot of um, compliance. People are very good at that. And so you can see where Adventist education is growing and where it's, it's threatened. Um, or where it's plateaued. And if it's plateaued, then that's normally a sign that decline is on the way. So for institutions, for in, those of your students who are in institutional leadership, who want some context, and after all, context is everything, mm. um, then looking at the institutional statistics uh, will be very helpful to you. I may add, we used to publish more statistics on elementary and secondary schools than we do now, simply because the report grew too large. But we do have more detailed statistics on secondary schools for each um, that, that go down below the division level. And if, if people wanted access to that, then they could contact us and we'd be willing to help them with it. Or they can communicate with their own division who will have the statistics because they send them to us from which we compile the the, the larger totals and subtotals. So there is, we do have, one of the most interesting things that happens is when church leaders email me and ask for certain types of statistics. And at times I feel like replying, you've been a pastor, you've been a conference and union leader. Have you ever reported those statistics ever? No. Well, then how do you think I know them? It's as though they think, you know, that I suppose it speaks well of their view of the ASTR or the GC, that we have some magic conduit for, for, for getting these statistics. And we don't. It, S setting setting you up on a podium to bring all kinds of amazing things. Hey, let me ask, let me ask you this question. Uh, what somebody mentioned this in the chat, the, the idea of secularization. So what it made me think of is, uh, maybe there's some data that are available outside of the things that you collect that could be, and maybe this is teasing out some of the research yeah. uh, that you're thinking about. Maybe you could just sort of give us an idea about some of the things that you're doing even in, in that realm. Yeah, no, that's, that's right, Randy. We've, we've done research, surveys of church members, very large surveys with, with very uh, high ends and therefore very high reliability rate, very low margins of error, less than 1%. Um, and that gives us some sense of the impact of secularization, um, which is not limited, by the way, to just certain divisions. Uh, and of course, we're in a global community now, and um, it's not surprising that we see some of the same trends taking place in North America, in Kenya, for example, to give an actual example, because they're reading the same things online that American Adventists are reading, um, and they're being influenced in the same ways. So uh, that really, the statistics doesn't give you a sense of that. The very large surveys and some qualitative studies we've done of church members and of pastors and a survey that's going on of institutional employees, th that will give us more insights into that particular dynamic, but also into the, the reasons why church members stay and leave, for example. Mm. Um, mm. Can I uh, interject a question here? Uh, David, very often we hear that there is a developing generation gap in the church because we are losing so many of our young people. And there's all kinds of numbers that are being thrown around that that come from, you know, 40 to 70% of our young people are leaving. Are there any um, actual studies that have been done to, to be more accurate in, in the reporting of how many young people we are actually retaining? It's, it's a good question, Eric. And I think the first point to make is that it's different in different parts of the world. Mm -hmm. The, uh, the median age for an Adventist is 36, roughly. And when I share that with people from certain parts of the world, they're astonished because it isn't true for their reality. But it's like, you know what? This isn't just for your country. This is for everywhere. It's for Latin America and Africa and Southeast Asia as well, where the church 
is very young and is growing among young people. Um, the worst areas for youth retention are undoubtedly the Western world. Uh, but postmodernity is no longer re restricted to Western Europe, North America, and Australasia. Uh, it's affecting Brazil and Argentina. And I mean, that comes more from the sociological research, but even the statistics, everyone who thinks, oh, the church in South America is just growing, 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 and, and it's all great. Compare Brazil with Argentina and Chile and Uruguay. Compare, for that matter, certain parts of Brazil now with Bolivia and Ecuador and Peru. Uh, South America is not all the same. This is a mistake that people from the rest of the world often make. Africa is not all the same and, and so on and so forth. Mm -hmm. um, and so it's, it's, you can see actually where um, secularization is taking effect and taking a toll because everywhere that that's the case, membership growth is much more difficult. And that includes some places where it used to be better and isn't now. So are, are you, I, I, am I understanding this correctly? You're looking at membership growth as it's peeling off and then equating that or at least drawing a causal between secularization? I, one has to be very cautious with, with that kind of, you know, that's a very, <laughs> yeah, that's yeah. A very grand narrative kind of type of causation. <laughs> um, but I will say the places where Adventist church growth is the most difficult are places that are the most materialistic, uh, the most postmodern, and the most post-Christian. Mm. And you can start, what I think you can start to see is a hint of that in the church statistics, where they begin to change. And I think that's where an astute leader paying attention to the statistics would start to get some insights and start to say, mm. you know, okay, Things used to be fine for us, but maybe something is happening here. Uh, so, yeah. um, it's very interesting what you're saying. Um, when we study church growth trends worldwide, there is one principle that we have um, often repeated in church growth classes: is that uh, it is easier to win the masses than the classes meaning that very often the lower uh, economic levels of society are more receptive to the gospel as preached by Adventists than um, the more arrived <laughs> middle class where life is more comfortable and so on. And one thing that we are observing in our denomination is that we are very good when people come into the church to give them a new way of seeing life. And then they send their children to Adventist schools and Adventist schools have a tendency to actually take them from, from their original sociological level and, and, and put them into the middle class. Um, and therefore there is this phenomenon that church growth experts call redemption and lift, uh, which means that we're lifting people into those classes in society where uh, church growth is more difficult to sell. Yes, no, that's right. But this, the, the, the statistics we collect don't shed light on that. Yeah. I, I agree with you. And indeed that's been identified by Bull and Lockhart in their somewhat tendentious, but still quite useful book, Seeking a Sanctuary. Um, that it, you're right, you're right. And, and it works actually in more, in more ways than than one uh, in different parts of the world, but I mean that's a, that's a that's a different topic, I think. Yeah. Jay, can I actually answer a question that's come up in the chat that I've noticed? Is that mm -hmm. all right? Yes, absolutely, yes. please. Yeah, it's please. a question yep. from from Paulette Johnson, who of course I I, I work with actually on library uh, and a different sort of data related project about how these statistics affected the World Church Strategic Plan. So. Much of the strategic plan is really drawn from the surveys that we do, but we do take into account the statistical analysis and the emphasis, the very strong emphasis in the I will go strategic focus on discipleship partly comes from the statistical analysis that we've done. So it's an excellent question, which is why I wanted to make sure I answered it. Uh, the statistics do feed into the World Church strategic plan, but 
I think they're going to be even more relevant for strategic plans at the union and conference level, um, because obviously a, a world church strategic focus uh, has to be sort of, you know, somewhat stratospheric because it's got to cover all eventualities. I think it could be even more useful for church leaders at different levels of structure. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Brand, maybe you could uh, highlight maybe another question or two. We're going to be winding things up shortly after eight o'clock, and then we'll, uh, we'll come back, uh, David, and give you a chance to maybe try to bring some summary things that you want to leave us with uh, after we get through a few more questions here. So, well, I, you know, I'm as a, as a psychologist, you know, I can't resist this uh, sort of a human interest question. So um, I hope it's of interest. You hinted at this actually a while ago, uh, but just to sort of clarify maybe a, f a few more details. Uh, do, you ever do you ever get pressure from anyone or anywhere uh, to support some sort of an agenda uh, with your data? No, I keep waiting for it to happen. Um, <laughs> and it hasn't happened yet. Um, wow. So I don't know, maybe I'm, I seem sufficiently dogmatic and, and so forth that, you know, people think that I, I won't say yes and I therefore don't get asked. No, I, in all seriousness, as, as I mentioned at the start, Dr. Ung has gone in a certain direction. And I do think there's a recognition in many parts of the world now that the model that we had that we thought was so successful and indeed was successful, but is become distorted by an emphasis on numbers and that we need to, there needs to be a recalibration um, and that there needs to be a concern for the very large numbers of people who we do win through mass public evangelistic events who don't always stay. So there is a, there, there's, I've never been felt, I've never been either explicitly asked or felt any um, kind of implicit pressure to, to do yeah. things in a certain way. That's good. good news. Listen, let, let me just one more final one. I wanted I wanted to get this one in. And, and Randy, I think you'll forgive me because no, we both, we both have an interest in innovation. Yeah. Well, there you and, go. Uh, Andrew, good. Andrew Perry has suggested, uh, would there be any interest or support uh, for opening an innovation challenge uh, to perhaps graduate students in our higher education institutions or some other constituency uh, to have students uh, brainstorm about uh, new ways of uh, perhaps extracting some patterns from these data that uh, you know no one has thought of yet. I'd love that. Um, we, we've we've tried, though not obviously with sufficient emphasis, to try to work out ways that we can get crowdsourcing to help us, hmm. um, and nothing has happened, which is why I say we obviously haven't done it with enough emphasis. Um, that's one reason I was very happy to speak to this group this evening. Um, for those of you who are going to be teaching, who are teachers yourselves or um, have a role in education, uh, this is a great subject for a class. And, you know, most, a great many Adventist young people are really committed to the church and would love to be making a contribution to the church's growth. Um and we don't always make the most of that as church leaders. And what a, what a fantastic way this would be for people to actually start to say, and again, it doesn't have to be necessarily at the global level, do it for a conference, do it for a union. And I think the fact that we've been doing the research more in the last 10 years means there's now an openness. Church administrators are now beginning to assume that things should be based on research. They should make evidence-based policy. They're looking for research. Um, and if nothing else, they can. if there's no receptivity at the local level, they can always channel it through to us and it can help our analysis. You know, we, by the standards of the GC, we're a relatively large department, but by the standards of what we do, we're massively understaffed. There's so much more we could do. Um, and but, you know, especially in the current post-COVID financial situation, I'm not looking to increase my, for any increase in my department. I hope to avoid the, the, the opposite. So this is where we need to make use of talented Adventist 
lay people and indeed educators and people engaged in this kind of class who are doing research for their degree, who are teaching others. Um, we have a huge talent pool in the church. The problem is finding ways to leverage it, to synergize it, to, to feed through. And so maybe that's one of the areas that an innovation lab could work on, just how to, to maximize the talent that's there. And then we could start to do that kind of crowdsourcing type analysis of, of, of statistics. So if someone wanted to contact you, would that be a, a good thing to do? Or yes. would they go through, they just contact you directly? If they have either maybe an idea, would that be good? Or if they say, listen, I have some time and I have some interest. Do you have some projects? Maybe that would be another way to contact you. So if they don't have ideas, but they have time and they're trying to develop some expertise, that might be. Absolutely. Uh, And write to archives at gc.adventist.org. That's archives at gc.adventist.org. We'd be glad to hear from people. Good. That that would be a good one to, to just drop into the chat. Somebody could do that for us. All right. So we're we're coming to the close. And uh, before you go there. OK. Uh, All right. Can I just um, highlight something that I'm aware of and give David a chance to at least say a, a, a little paragraph about it? But I if I understand correctly, you recently wrote a book based on research of uh, Adventist missionaries. Yes. And one of the things that you found is an astonishing pattern, especially in the early Adventist missionaries. And if I can just summarize it quickly, it would be something like that. Younger Adventists went out realizing that they were sacrificing probably their life and that they would not survive and come back. Is that true? And could you just say something about it? Because that is incredible. Yeah, it's, it's, it was humbling. It was actually a difficult book to write. Um, I've, I've worked on no other, and I've done a lot of academic writing, but on 16th and 17th century history and some other Adventist history, I've never before actually had to regularly turn away from the computer screen just because of the, you know, the, 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 the intensity of what I was reading. It, it was just so sad. Graphic descriptions of people's, the week it took them to die of various diseases and of them singing hymns as they die with people around them. I mean, just, you know, of these, we are not worthy <laughs> as the author of Hebrews mm-hmm. says. Um, but the astonishing thing to me is that most much of the evidence for that comes from church periodicals and obituaries. And this is from an era when almost all church members read the church papers. So people knew, people knew that if they went out, they were taking their life very literally in their hands. And even if they didn't die, they might serve for 15 years and never see their family again. And there was no shortage, even with the appalling number of, of, of deaths, which is, is, is due to the, the, the prevalence of disease, especially in the tropics, that there were no cures for. Um, but there was never any shortage of the next, the next couple, and it was usually couples, often very young, willing to go out. And of course, enough survived uh, that they made the church. Without that sacrifice, the church would not exist. So it was, it was humbling and sobering. The, the name of that book? Uh, a living sacrifice. All right. Yeah. It's an incredible book, and I highly recommend it, um, not only for its historical uh, weight uh, for the mission movement in the church, but also as a glimmer of hope that this idealism, this, this willingness to sacrifice for the sake of Christ is still alive in our generation today. Um, and the question is, what will it take to revive that kind of spirit uh, where people learn to, to see their life uh, in a different perspective? And thank you, David. Um, this, this, this puts a very humbling perspective also on your work. 
because you're not only a numbers guy, you're not only a statistics guy and an archives guy, but you, you're ultimately the custodian of very precious, um, a precious history of our church. And we thank you for that. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Thank you, Eric. I appreciate that. Uh, as we close this up, uh, we'd like to just give you no questions now. And just maybe if you could just think about, you know, what is it that you want to, is there a nugget or two that you can leave with us just as we're parting here, uh, just within the next minute or two? Yeah, I, I think what I would like to end on is is two laws, <laughs> uh, Campbell's law and Goodhart's law. <laughs> Campbell's law says that the more any quantitative social indicator is used for social decision making, the more subject it will be to corruption pressures and the more apt it will be to distort and to corrupt the social press processes it is intended to monitor. And I'm actually going to put that in the chat hmm. because it's a bit much to take on board, right? <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. Thank you. Um, this is Campbell's law. There's a simpler version, which is Goodhart's law. When a measure becomes a target, it ceases to be a good measure. Let me say that again. When a measure becomes a target, it ceases to be a good measure. You'll put, you're even dropping that one in there too. That would, would be. Okay, a, sure. A, okay. Yeah, th uh, this is uh, uh, focusing on the, the, uh, um, Focusing on the results, not the process that gets the results. Right, right. And I mean, and it's true. And at times people have said to me in church leadership, well, you know, should we use this instead of membership? Should we use that? And I don't mean to sound too jaded, but whatever we use, people will game it because it's human nature. And that is, I, I, I don't feel jaded or disillusioned because uh, my father... Uh, was a church pastor and administrator, and I grew up always knowing that church administrators were human and made um, and, and 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 made mistakes. So I've never been disillusioned by that. Um, but one just has to be realistic about it and say when there are certain rewards, um, which at the in conference level. They may be financial for how a church does in, in gaining its in increasing membership. Uh, for conferences, unions, and divisions, it may there's the incentive of increased representation at a conference, union, general conference session. But there's also status and prestige. And whatever we choose, people will want to look good. And we're humans. And so whatever the indicator are, the indicators are people will gain it. And what we just have to continually try to do is bear in mind when a measure becomes a target, it ceases to be a good measure and keep pushing church leaders back towards integrity, um, back towards honesty, back toward, because ultimately, well, first, we're not fooling God. We're not deceiving God. That's right. But also, let's take it from that ultimate step down to strategic planning, leadership. How can you be a good leader if you don't actually know how many members you are or where they are or how they're distributed? And this is one reason the South American division sort of paved a, a way, blazed a trail on membership audits because they were finding they were printing hundreds of thousands more books or quarterlies than they needed because they were basing it on their approximate membership. And they said, we've got to be good stewards. And equally, if you're trying to do strategic planning, planning for church growth, how can you do it unless you know these things? So all we can, we, we, we recognize that when a measure becomes a target, it ceases to be a good measure. All we can do is to keep encouraging people to saying, remember why we collect this in the first place. It's about what we're trying to understand. It's not about the target. And I think it's a cultural shift. And that's, as from what I said earlier, I don't believe it was present so much for the first hundred years of the church that our statistical measures were targets. And I think making them targets has been a problem. And so some of your students I know work in church leadership at various stages. And so I would encourage you when you are in the position to make decisions, 
um, encourage people not to see them as targets, but to see them as measures that can make them more effective as church leaders and that can make the church more effective in its ministry and mission, which ultimately is what we're about. Uh, Dr. David Trim, we're uh, honored that you were able to come. This has been a, a fantastic discussion. We've had good questions. Uh, thank you, participants. What a robust conversation in the chat. And in fact, uh, Dr. Trim, we'll make sure and we send this to you so you could look through it. I'm sure you'd find that very interesting as well. Uh, Dr. Eric Baumgartner, thank you for uh, joining in to the uh, conversation. And Dr. Jay Brand as well. Uh, thank you for the chat. Uh, this is Randy Siebold. I'm going to pass it uh, back, back over to uh, Dr. Board Henry Saturnay, the chair of the leadership department at Andrews University. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Dr. Siebold. And thank you also, Dr. Trim, for this uh, wonderful presentation. In a couple of minutes, I'm going to invite uh, the dean of the uh, College of Education and Inter International Services, Dr. Thorpe, to bring the closing, uh, uh, closing remarks and the closing prayer. But before that, I would like to mention to you that this is the end of this series on research of, uh, for decision makers, but we have some exciting events coming. In fact, we have three, three events coming in the leadership department. We have the orientation for new students, the new cohort, that will start on July 19, or every year we have the third week of July, we uh, welcome our new participants. Um, and after that, the following week, we are going to have the annual conference. And I'm going to invite Dr. Brand again to give us a, quickly an idea of what's going to happen on that day uh, for the, on July 26 for the annual conference. Oh. Thank you, Dr. Saturnay. Uh, yes, I, you know, I'll, I'll be brief, but um, a, a wonderful uh, lady, um, scholar, um, practitioner, uh, leadership coach, in organizational innovator, uh, cross-cultural expert. Uh, she, she has many, many wonderful hats. Uh, Bettina von Stamm will be our guest speaker. And she's actually going to be broadcasting from the Hope Channel in Domstadt, Germany. Uh, and that's her home turf. Uh, she's, I believe, lives in Berlin these days, but she spent many years in London in the UK. Uh, but she's, she's indeed a globetrotter. Uh, she's going to share with us um, aspects of innovation, uh, diversity and inclusion, uh, and, um, how you know, organizations can be improved uh, through creativity and cross-cultural competence. So I, I just, I really look forward to the session. There's gonna be more of a keynote uh, in, the, in the first part of the session. And then in the afternoon, at least Michigan time, uh, there will be more of an interactive workshop where she will help leaders understand how to apply the theories and concepts that she'll discuss uh, in the first session, which will be the morning session in Michigan. Uh, so I, I hope you can join us. I guarantee you it will be fascinating. Thank you very much, Dr. Brian. We need to say that the main lecture, the main presentation, the keynote speech in the morning will be open to the public. And uh, feel free to contact us at leader at andrews.edu and we'll be happy to send you the link and uh, you can be, participate in this live event. And, uh, leader, L-E-A-D-E-R, at andrews.edu, and we'll be happy to get in touch with you. Uh, once we are done with the annual conference, the same day, we will start with the roundtable that we have every year. And I would like to invite Dr. Baumgartner to just tell us what is our theme for this year and what's going to happen and for whom this roundtable is prepared. The roundtable is our annual event where all the people that are in one of the leadership programs at Andrews University uh, will come together once a year. And so it's an event that supports them in their journey. And the, the theme for this uh, year is powering innovation through diversity and collaboration. So it is an extension of the first day with Bettina Stamm, 
and then we'll go into more detail and it will also focus on uh, supporting uh, existing participants in the leadership programs in their journey towards the finish line because ultimately they are all engaged in trying to finish their degree journey. I can see Kay smiling. Uh, she knows exactly what I'm talking about and uh, I hope you will all be there. Thank you. And now I'd like to leave you with Dean Thorpe for the closing remarks and the closing prayer. <laughs> thank you so much, um, Dr. Saturnay. And I want to say a special thank you to Dr. Trim as well. Um, how, how, what better way to end a series on the importance of statistics by not just talking about the importance of statistics, but reminding us of some of the challenges and dangers of abusing statistics that we as leaders need to know how to use them the right way and not how, how to twist them to make them say what we want them to, that we need to listen uh, to them because to try to do anything else is unethical. And uh, as Dr. Trim rightly pointed out, God always knows the truth. And I think we as leaders should be doing everything we can to um, be as faithful as we can to truth in order to move our institutions, whether we're in a classroom or a church or an office somewhere um, down a path that is, that is right and righteous. So thank you, Dr. Trim. But I also wanna thank all of the other speakers we've had. This has been a marvelous series. And I wanna thank all of you who've been involved, especially the wonderful leadership team, all of the faculty, the chair who have worked diligently. And I'll tell you, one of the things that I know at Andrews University, especially during this time of COVID, Bell Hall is quiet we, because we do a lot of our courses online in almost all of the departments in the College of Education. But you can always tell when we're having our webinar and when it's coming close to the time for our round table and our conference because people pop up and uh, you see them in on the grounds, but you're, you're seeing them in face-to-face, -face, not just on screen. So it's, it's an exciting time. I can feel the enthusiasm in the hallway and I'm hoping, and I know that it will translate to all of you in your homes. We'll, take some of that enthusiasm and send it to you through the uh, wonderful magic that we've all come to love now because of COVID called, uh, uh, you know, video conferencing and Zoom. So thank you so much uh, to Dr. Saturnay, to all of the faculty members of the leadership department who've made this possible. And thank you to all the speakers who've also taken their time. Dr. Trim, thank you for being the uh, cleanup hitter to use an American baseball term. Tried to use cricket, but don't know enough about it. <laughs> so uh, let's bow our heads. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for the many gifts you give to us and for the opportunities we have to serve you in our leadership roles, wherever they may be. Yes. We ask, Lord, that you will be with us as we depart, be with each and every one of us, with every speaker we've had, with every student, every listener, every participant in this series. We ask that you will be with them in a special way and that they will be able to find the right way and the righteous path to lead in the area where they serve. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Thank you very much, Dr. Thorpe. And thank you to all of you for your participation and your contribution to the success of this series. May God bless you and see you. Uh, the next appointment is the annual conference that is coming in about two weeks. Thank you so much and God bless you all. <laughs>